Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live this morning from home once again. Yeah, I've been home all this past week and will be home most of this week as well. I've got a truck in the shop being worked on. Um, hopefully I'll be back on the road late this week. But... Uh, there's a possibility that I'll be home a third weekend before I take off again. We'll just see what the Lord the Lord has in store. We trust in Him and we will do as He lays out His plans. Our plans are always subject to change, but His plans are always, they're always true. They're always right. And they lead us in a direction that... Uh, most often, we wouldn't go on our own. But it's good to be here. We've had a lot of rain over the, the week that I've been here. We just had two and a half inches yesterday, um, almost two inches a couple of days before. Just phenomenal amounts of water here in this area of central Nebraska. We're going to be discussing, as, as promised last week, or as mentioned last week, about what it means to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. As you see in the background, so often when I'm home and am able to be outside, I put the cross in the background. I want to ask you some questions about that cross. First one is an obvious question. What does that cross mean to you? What does it represent? What, what, is, what is the meaning behind the cross? Well, many of us are going to say, and myself included, it means that it, or it's a reminder of how Jesus died. But we have to remember back in those days, that was the method of cruel punishment. That's how the Romans put people to death, was through crucifixion. So Jesus was not the first, and he wasn't the last, to be crucified on a cross. So why did the cross become a symbol of Christianity? Is it a symbol of Christianity for you? What does the cross, when you see the cross, what does it mean to you? Years ago... I used to wear a fairly good-sized cross around my neck. I didn't wear it on the outside. I kept it on the inside. And each time it, it hit my chest underneath of my, my shirt, it was a reminder of what Jesus did for me. But I saw other people wearing crosses, and they wore them on the outside, and they, you know, their life just didn't quite represent what I understood the cross to mean. They weren't living for Jesus. They weren't representing Jesus. It was costume jewelry. And I didn't want others to potentially see this cross or me draw attention to this cross that I wore and have someone think that, well, that's just costume jewelry. So it's been several years since I've worn that, that cross around my neck. But what it did was it didn't just remind me of what Jesus did. It reminded me of what I'm to do because of what Jesus did. So to me, when I look at this, this cross, yeah, it's a representation of the crucifixion cross. It's a reminder of what Jesus did. But when I see the cross, it's a reminder of what I, as a Christian, must do. Now, we don't worship the cross. We worship Christ. We worship God through Jesus Christ. We don't worship the cross, or it could become an idol. And I believe to some people, even the cross is an idol. They worship the cross. Let me give you an example. In one of the churches that I served, there was this unusually shaped cross up on the, the back or the front wall of the sanctuary, up behind the stage. 
So as you sat in the pews, you could see this. It, it had a backlight in it. It was stained glass. It had a, a unique shape to it. It didn't look anything like this. But it was looked upon as something beautiful by some of the members of the congregation. Well, I asked the, the elders, can I build a wooden cross, much like the one behind me, and put it on a base and put it up on the stage? And I gave them the reason why. It's not so we can worship the cross. It's a reminder. It's an old rugged cross. We sing that old hymn, the old rugged cross. It's a reminder of what Jesus did for us. But it's also a reminder of what Jesus says. To be my disciple, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. What kind of a cross do we pick up? Is it a beautiful backlit cross? Or is it the old rugged cross? Well, I got permission to put this cross up on the stage. And some members of the congregation were deeply offended by that. They said it... it Ruins the beauty of our sanctuary. Yeah. It should. It should. As a reminder of what Jesus did for us. But also as a reminder. That if we proclaim to be Christians. And we just live a worldly life. We're not picking up our cross. So the cross is a reminder of what we must do to follow Jesus. This cross buried into the ground has a story behind it. My son had a, had a friend years and years ago. Came from a troubled home. He spent a lot of time with me and my son. And one day, I don't, you can't see the fire pit right over here next to it, but there's a pile of firewood up there, a fire pit, and the cross. And this was a place where we gathered sometimes, my son and I, and I'd have him invite his friends. But be, to plant this cross, to put it into the ground, one day I told my son, hey, invite Isaac to come over. I built this cross, and I want to put it in the ground. And then we are going to build this fire pit and so on and so forth. So Isaac came over and he helped dig the hole. He put the cross in the ground. He tamped the dirt back in there. He laid claim to this. And I didn't really understand how much it meant to him until I had people telling me that when school was over, Instead of Isaac going home, he would come here to the house and he would sit or stand out here in front of this cross for a considerable amount of time. And then he'd wander on towards home. There's a lot of meaning behind this cross. A lot of meaning behind this cross. What impact did it have on this young boy, Isaac? I'm not real sure. But it was enough to have him come over here and stand before it and think. So with that, all of that in mind, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the cross. The fact that you died that crucifixion death for me and for everyone listening. For even those who will never, never call on your name, Lord. You died for them on that crucifixion cross. This cross, Lord, is a representation of what you did. Of how you died that brutal death. You were removed from that cross. Carried to a, an unused grave. 
the stone was placed before the entrance to that grave. And on the third day, when those who went to find you, couldn't, you couldn't be found because you had been risen. You had risen. You had been resurrected from the dead, Lord. But in the meantime, you paid the debt that we all owe. For the wages of sin is death. And you paid that wage on our behalf for all who would follow you. For all who would pick up their cross daily and follow you. Lord, as we go through this message, help us to understand what that cross is. Help us to understand what it means to be a disciple of yours. Help us to understand that the life that we once lived was not life. But when we died as you have died, we have been resurrected as you have been resurrected a newness of life. Lord, I lift this message up to you, and I pray that those who have ears will hear and set forth the words that they hear into practice in their life. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. I will follow, but. That's the title of this message. I will follow, but. We make excuses, don't we? I will follow you, Jesus, but... And we'll come back to that at the end of this message. I want us to think some more about this cross. Jesus hung on a cross. It wasn't quite like this. Similar, I guess, because it was made of wood. But it was made out of poles. It was stood higher off the ground than this. I, this is just a representation. But I want us to think about when Jesus says you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. Well, we know that this cross represents his crucifixion. So when we talk about or when scripture talks about you must pick up your cross, we need to understand what that cross is and what it isn't. But first I want to share with you just to bring forth the mood of this message, the seriousness of this message, the tearfulness of this message, the cry of the heart of this message. Let's look at some things that occurred to Jesus prior to dying on that cross. We're not going to go to Scripture. We're just going to recap some Scripture here. Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by one of the disciples named Judas Iscariot. The devil entered into Judas, and he carried out the devil's plan, which ultimately was God's plan. He just allowed Satan, or the devil, to carry it out. So Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested. Jesus was put on a on a mock trial, a fake trial. Do you think we, we have fake trials in, the, in our world today of leaders and uh, of different people? Yeah, this was a mock trial. This was a kangaroo court, if you will. Jesus was put on trial. What did those in the crowd holler? Crucify him, crucify him. Release Barabbas to us, but crucify Jesus. Jesus was disowned. Peter disowned him three times that night that he was on trial. Jesus was spit on. He was mocked. He was beaten. And he was flogged. Then he was forced to carry his own cross for a, a, a distance. But he was so weak from being flogged 
and being beaten. But the Romans forced this man from the countryside of Cyrene. His name was Simon. Simon from Cyrene forced him to carry Jesus' cross up to the hill of Golgotha. Jesus was too weak to do it. So Simon of Cyrene was forced to do it for him. And then we know that Jesus was crucified. He was nailed to that cross in his hands and his feet. And he died an excruciating death. No, you don't bleed to death. You suffocate in the midst of a crucifixion. I won't go into all of the gory details of a crucifixion. But we understand. Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested. He was put on trial. He was disowned. He was spit on. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was flogged. He was forced to carry his own cross for a ways. And then he was crucified. In Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. What is this all about in that first verse, first verse 37? What is that all about? If I love my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my wife, my husband, whatever, my spouse, if I love them more than Jesus, I'm not worthy of him. When Jesus tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, that means that we put him above everyone else and everything else. It means we love God more than we love time. It means we love God more than we love our possessions. It means we love God more than we love ourselves. It means we love God more than anything. We love God more than anything. And if we don't, we're not worthy of him. Well, Stace, I don't want to hear this if you're going to tell me that I'm not worthy of God. I'm not the one telling you this. I'm reading the Word of God. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. How important is it that we pick up our cross and follow Jesus. What is the cross? What is the cross? We're going to focus on that now for a little bit. What is the cross? No, it's not just a symbol. What is the cross? Maybe you've been taught that your cross is some burden that you're, you have to carry through life. Like Paul. With a thorn in his flesh, he asked God three different times to remove it. But God finally said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. He did not remove that thorn. Is the cross like a thorn in your flesh? What is your cross? What is the cross that you must pick up daily and follow Jesus? Now, several years ago, as I was exiting a church, as God was calling me to leave this congregation, I did a similar message on picking up your cross. And at the end of that message, 
that wooden cross that was up on the stage that offended some people, I went and I picked that up and I put it over my shoulder and I quoted the scripture. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must pick up their cross daily and follow me as I walked down the center aisle and exited the sanctuary. Not to return again as a pastor of that church. How important was that message? God used that message to tell people that being a part of a particular church or de congregation or a denomination is not as great as loving Him. Some people love the sanctuary more than they loved God. Some people loved the building more than they love God. Some people love the idea of worship more than they love God. But that message that morning was to set forth the example of what we as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ, are to do. No, we're not supposed to have a dramatic scene where we go and we pick up a cross and draw attention to ourselves. That was not the intent of that. The intent was to draw the attention to the cross and what it means to pick up your cross daily and follow him. Let's go back and look at those things dealing with the cross. Jesus was betrayed. In that congregation, I was betrayed. Was I arrested? No, but there were people within that congregation that were looking for any excuse to wrongly accuse me of whatever they could come up with. Was I put on trial? Many times. At our board meetings, I was put on trial because I was not teaching what that denomination required. I was teaching the Word of God not the word of man. Was I ever spit on? No, but I just as well have. I just as well have been. Was I mocked? Yeah. Yeah. By other pastors of that denomination? Yeah. I was mocked. I was shunned. Was I ever beaten? Not with not with fists, but with words. Was I ever flogged? No, not to the extent that Jesus was. But the words and the actions of some people cut really, really deep and leave marks. They leave scars. Did I carry my own cross? Did I carry the cross out of that sanctuary? Yes, I did. Was I crucified? Yes, I was. Not to the point of my physical death. I was crucified before I ever walked into that building to begin that ministry. Crucified. Of my own self-desires. Of my own self-will my own ego, my own pride, my own everything. I had to love God more than any other thing in my life or any other one in my life to carry out what he called me to do in that church. Was that easy? Absolutely not. Is it easy being out on the road today and doing this similar type of ministry with people that will spit on you, will reject you, will betray you, will look for excuses to have you arrested or falsely accused, that will mock you. You see, friends, when I left the previous congregations to go to this one, as the Lord called me to do,
They mocked me. I lost my friends in those congregations. They accused me of betraying them. They accused me of being a false teacher because I went from one denomination to another. Well, what you taught here was false then, if you, if you truly believe that. They didn't understand the reason I went to the next congregation. That, my friends, is our cross. That, my friends, is our, is our cross. I found these questions as I was researching for this message. I was going to bring them up later, but I think right now is the, the opportune time. So are you willing to follow Jesus if, quote unquote, if, are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your closest friends? I lost my closest friends. When I left with the cross over my shoulder from this congregation, I lost some of my closest friends. If it means alienation from your family. My friends, if you've experienced that, you'll, you'll understand more about what it means to pick up your cross daily. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your reputation? I can go to the village in which I once served. And there will be no one speak to me. No one speak to me in that village. Because I destroyed a church. No, I set a body of believers free. God set them free. I was just a messenger. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? I never, I don't consider ministry as a job, but that was my source of income at the time. So when I left that congregation that morning, I left an income. But I trusted Christ to provide. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? I didn't lose my physical life, but I lost my way of life. I love being a minister, a pastor of a congregation. It is so fulfilling. It is so challenging. It is so meaningful. It is so important. And it's something that I have dedicated my life to. And maybe one day he'll call me back into serving a physical congregation, standing in a sanctuary or a house of worship. We'll see where that goes. But for right now, I know where he has me, and it's out on the road doing ministry. So are you willing to follow Jesus if? And maybe you've got some other questions there. Well, I would follow you, Jesus, but... And that's the title of the message. I would follow you, or I will follow you, Jesus. But I don't want to lose my friends. I don't want to be alienated from my family. I don't want to lose my reputation. I don't want to lose my job or my actual life. And maybe that might mean Losing your physical life on behalf of the gospel. In Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if any 
one comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What is a disciple? We need to define what a disciple is. A disciple is a follower or a student or a learner of someone. If you are following Jesus, you're walking with him along the narrow path, right? And you're doing as he commands you to do. Do this and you go do it. Don't do this and you don't do it. You follow his very word. You follow his lead. Because you know he will not lead you astray. You are a student. You're studying the one that you're following. Are you studying who Jesus is? When I list these words, betrayal, arrested, put on trial, disowned, spit on, mocked, beaten, flogged, crucified, carried his own cross for a ways. We study about who Jesus is and what he endured on our behalf. And a disciple is a learner. Someone who is open to receive God's word, the message of his word to encourage us us, to be not who we were yesterday, but to be renewed, to be anew day after day after day as we grow closer and closer in our knowledge of who Jesus is. As we aim not for perfection because we will never be perfect, but as we aim to be like Jesus. We can't be like Jesus if we don't follow him, if we're not a student or if we don't study who he is. And if we refuse to be a learner, we can't be his disciple. So what does it take to be a disciple? It's more than just picking up our cross and following him daily. It tells us, God's word tells us that we must hate our mother and our father. Our brother and our sister, our children, our co-workers. We're to hate everyone. But is that the kind of hate that we know? God is using in his word, that word hate, as a strong word to get our attention that says, I want your love and affection. I want it all from you. And then what you receive back from me, you can give to others. But I want all of you first. I want all of you first. Are you giving all of who you are to Jesus? And then what he gives back to you, the life that you live through him, is that what you're giving other people? That's what my life consists of. So where does this, you must pick up your cross daily to follow him, to be his disciple. You must pick up his, your cross daily. Let's turn back to the gospel of Mark in the eighth chapter. Actually, yeah, (coughs) excuse me, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his, his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We now have a new word incorporated into this. Deny yourself. To be my disciple, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. So if you love anyone or anything more than you love God, you're not worthy of God or worthy of being his disciple. 
if you don't hate your brother and your parents and your sister and your family, your children, you love them more than God, you're not worthy of being his disciple. So how do we become his disciple? We must first deny ourselves. We've got to deny ourselves and our, our wants, our desires, and seek after God's wants and God's desires. What are God's wants? For everyone to be saved. What are his desires? For everyone to know the one whom he sent, which is Jesus Christ. Because the only way we'll know the Father is to know the Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know the Father? Do you know the Son? Have you denied yourself? Have you picked up your cross? When I pick up my cross, I know that I'm going to be betrayed. Somewhere along the line, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm, I'm going to be falsely accused. I may be put on trial, not a, in a courthouse, but on trial by other people. In other words, I'll be judged by others. I'll be disowned. I will be spit on. I'll be mocked. I may even be beaten with words. You know that old saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? As I said a little bit ago, words cut deep and leave scars. Words cut deep and leave scars as they heal and may never heal, actually. So part of picking up my cross and following Jesus means that I must crucify myself, allow myself to be crucified. I must deny myself to follow Christ. I want to be a pastor of a congregation again. Now, I could go and make that happen more than likely. I could go and try to open doors that Christ himself has not yet opened. What ministry would there be in that? Part of my carrying my cross daily is trusting in Jesus and his perfect timing. Trusting in Jesus and his perfect timing. And in the meantime, doing what he has called me to do. This may all seem really, really complicated. But picking up our cross means that we choose to follow Jesus. It means we learn. We choose to be a learner. We choose to be a student. We choose to be a follower. We choose to be a disciple. But you know what, friends? That's not a one-time deal. When we pick up our cross, Jesus tells us that we're to do it daily. When you wake up in the morning, do you have a conscious decision to make whether you follow the world or follow Jesus? Do you have that conscious decision to make? I do. Every day. Every day I have to make that decision. And that decision is based upon whether I'm going to pick up my cross and follow Jesus or leave my cross laying somewhere and follow the world. That cross is who I am. That cross is who Jesus is in me. That cross is a representation of the penalty that he paid for my, my sin. And my responsibility in return for what Jesus has done for me is to love my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. Then, and only then, can I love myself 
and then love others as I love myself. Do you make a conscious decision to pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus? My friends, if you get lazy and don't make that conscious decision, do you realize that you made a decision anyway? Because if you don't consciously make that decision to follow Jesus, you've made the decision to follow the world. That's why it is so important to focus on pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus. If you've been taught that your cross is some burden like that thorn in the flesh, it's easy not to pick it up. I don't want to deal with this today. But when you're dealing with who Jesus truly is, and you love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, don't you look forward to waking up the next morning and making that conscious decision to pick up your cross and follow him? In Ephesians 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And we find out later, Christ includes faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. My friends, we can't pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus without faith. We can't pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus if we don't understand that we're saved by grace through that faith. It's just merely a burden, another decision that we have to make. But I look forward to that decision. And I have to confess, my friends, there's some days that I don't make that decision. Lord, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I just, I don't want to follow you today. You know what kind of a day that brings forth? A day of absolute misery. Because I'm missing my best friend. I'm missing my Savior. I'm missing out on life. And the fullness of life that is found only in Jesus. We turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified. Have you been crucified? Crucified. Allowed you, yourself to be crucified to the things of this world. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucified the flesh. Do you make a conscious decision to turn away from that sin daily as you pick up your cross and follow Jesus. In Romans chapter 6,
Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized, excuse me, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through bat baptism. This isn't water baptism for those of you who want to go that direction. This is not water baptism. This is a baptism into Christ Jesus. This is when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. When we said, I do in a marriage relationship with a lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified, with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we sh should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin now if we died with Christ we believe that we also live with him for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again death no longer has mastery over him the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, in verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not sin, let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That is the result, my friends, of picking up our cross daily and following him. Knowing that we'll, we may be betrayed, we may be falsely accused we may be judged or put on trial we may be disowned spit on mocked beaten flogged but we know that we will be crucified crucified meaning that will we be dead to the things of this world and made alive in jesus christ do you my friends want to live you want to live in Christ or do you want to die within the things of this world? I will follow, but I will follow, but this is where we make our excuses in Luke chapter 9. beginning in verse 57. It's in a section in the NIV entitled, The Cost of Following Jesus. Chapter 9 of Luke, beginning in verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. How many of you have said that to Jesus? I will follow you wherever you go. What was Jesus' response to you? Was it something like this that sounded just really, really confusing? You didn't know how to take it? Jesus replied in verse 58, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, if you're following me, you will make that commitment daily. You will pick up your cross daily and follow me. It can't be today and then take tomorrow off, and then come back and follow me two or three days later, this is a day-by-day-by-day-by-day basis that you will follow me. If you said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go, no matter where you go, Lord, 
I will follow you. He said to another man in verse 59, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. His father wasn't dead. That was an excuse. I need to go live with my father and help him until he dies. And then I will bury him and then I'll come follow you. If we don't study God's word, if we don't study what Jesus means behind what he says in his word, we miss that point. Oh, well, I can't even go bury my own family member or a friend who died. That's not what this says. We got to understand the culture. We got to understand what was going on in those days, how people lived, what, what were the circumstances. Let me go and bury my father. Well, how long before his father passes away? We don't know. It was an excuse, my friends. It was nothing but an excuse. How many of you make excuses not to follow Jesus? What it was Jesus' response to this man? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow. If you're going to follow me, I want you to do this. He gives him something to go and do. Don't worry about the dead. Let them bury themselves. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's what I get a chance to do. I don't know where God is calling you. Is he calling you to proclaim the kingdom of God? I do. That's where he's got me, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Verse 61, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus' response is something that blows our minds. He didn't deal with family. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What did that mean? Do you love your family more than me? Do you love your family more than me? Not me personally, but God. And you're not worthy of being my disciple, he says. What does this cross behind us represent? If I pick up my cross daily and follow him, I may lose my closest friends. I may be alienated from my family. I may lose my reputation. I might even lose my job. And I certainly know that to follow Jesus, I'm going to lose my life. But as I lose my life, I gain his. So my friends, are you willing to pick up your cross? Are you willing to make that decision daily to follow Jesus? To be his disciple, to be a student of his word and of who he is and to learn more about what he has offered you. Just maybe the good Lord will give you an opportunity to teach what he has shared with you. That cross is a reminder of what Jesus did for us. But it should also be a reminder of what Jesus wants us to do for him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for accepting me as your disciple. When you laid the call upon my life, I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Not knowing where you were going to send me, how you were going to send me, 
and what you were going to send me to do. But Lord, I trusted you. And I still trust you. I desire daily to pick up my cross and follow you. Because if I don't, Lord, if I don't follow you, I'm following the world. So, Lord, in our shortcomings, help us to understand where, where we're missing that decision. Where we're missing our focus in life. Where we're failing you, Lord. And teach us how to live for you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.